Well, it's great to be with you again today. Uh, I do recall last time the pulpit was much bigger. <laughs> and uh, I might have too much on my plate here, so we'll just see how that goes. Um, no, this is fine, thanks. It is a great privilege to be able to share with you again and to come and um, report back a little bit of what's been happening in Southern Africa. Thank you. And uh, to be able to come and thank you for your prayers and your support. Um, right at the end of what I want to share with you, I do want to share an illustration that I hope will help you understand that how important it is to us uh, to know that there are folk praying and uh, supporting us to be there. Um, it really is what carries us through. And so we thank you for inviting us to be part of your service this morning. Um, I was not happy to see all of the songs we sang this morning. Most of those are songs I don't like to hear or sing before I'm preaching because they're filled with so much emotion and so much truth about the reality of what the world needs and how the world needs light. And uh, our country is going to be facing a national election in August. Um, and we see how much darkness and confusion there is in South Africa when it comes to these political decisions. And I won't say anything about your country, um, but, but we're recognizing how much light we need, just as people, how we need God's light to come into our nations. And so when I sing songs like that, it's really meaningful that, you know, we who are believers in Christ have got the light. We've got the answer to the world's problems. Uh, and we see darknesses prevailing in so many places. Um, and so it's really great to be with you again and to share with you. Um, in preparation for this morning, I was reading through some papers here called the Zulu and Basutu Land Missionary Society. Uh, this is dated 1929 and uh, lists a number of people from this church who went to South Africa as missionaries. And I, I almost decided to just simply read this to you today, um, but it's too long. Um, but if you haven't seen this, maybe you'd like to borrow it or find it somewhere. And let me just mention a few names here. Names that you may not even know about, but who came from this church. Mr. and Mrs. McCordick. Um, and then there was uh, George Fales, who wasn't actually from here, but came to spend a couple of months here before he went to South Africa. Listen to this, what he said um, concerning this church. After spending several months in Zion City with the Grace Missionary Church before leaving for Africa, I thank God always on every remembrance of you. Such friends, such entertaining, such sacrificial giving, even to lives and a property. Um, and you, can, you could maybe get this and read it. Um, it's just amazing to see how God has used people from this church before. Miss Dorothy Johnson, Miss Lois Rockefeller, um, and one I'm often reminded of, Miss Myrtle Simpson, uh, Sisson. Uh, and you know how people from this church came across to South Africa and were such a vital part of the early history of, of uh, what is now called Zima in South, in South Africa. Um, it was not for many years before Scott and Carrie Mayhack came from this church to visit and spend time two years in South Africa. And then Donna, um, yeah, came also to visit South Africa. And uh, then the Seegers came, then the Beams came, then the Swanks came, then your pastor came, and I don't think I've left anyone out, I hope I haven't. But it's been amazing, as I said, just to see the history and the relationship over many years between this church and South Africa. And I do want to thank you and thank you for your prayers and pray that God would continue to raise up people. In this article, it talks about one young lady who, having heard of God's uh, work in South Africa, decided to go back with the returning missionary. So if there's anyone here who would like to go back with us in two months to South Africa, uh, you need to get your visas and passports ready. But God is still raising up people to come to Southern Africa. And we just pray and ask you to be part of praying that God would do that. Just briefly concerning our family, um, our own family have grown up as well. Uh, and some of you know them. Uh, the first time we came, Naomi was just a couple of months old. Gregory and Christopher were also very small. They've all grown up now, obviously, and carried on. For those who are interested, uh, Christopher, our eldest son, is now a qualified accountant. And he's just this week signed a contract to come and spend two years in the Cayman Islands as an accountant. Um, I don't know why he chose the Cayman Islands. It's like this big on the map. You know, you can hardly see it. 
And he, he says he wants us to come and visit. I, I'm not certain about landing on an island that's not big enough for a runway. Um, but anyway, he's going to be soon there. And then the Gregory, our second son, got married last year, towards the end of last year. And he's a pastor at, the, uh, at uh, Wilro Park Baptist Church. And we thank God for them. And Naomi, our youngest daughter, has just finished her pharmaceutical studies and is an intern at a local hospital for pharmacy. And we, we do thank God for his hand upon our family and we thank those who pray for them. We get cards from time to time, we get messages that you are praying for us and our family and the different prayer groups and we really do want to thank you for that. Our ministry over the past couple of years has been divided between administration and then the ministry of actually being amongst the Amazoni and being involved in Bible teaching. Um, unfortunately, as the years have gone on, this administration part seems to have grown as the mission grows, and so the actual Bible teaching kind of has been a little bit more limited. But we're really grateful for, to God for every opportunity of sharing the light as we've been singing with the Amazoni. Um, one of our main ministries is called ZEBS, Zion Evangelical Bible School. It is aimed specifically at the group of people in Southern Africa who call themselves Amazioni or people of Zion. Because it was from this city that missionaries went many years ago to start churches in South Africa. And unfortunately, um, when they returned back to the city of Zion, uh, what happened in South Africa is syncretism set in amongst those baby churches. And so today we have many, many millions of people who call themselves Amazioni or people of Zion. They are in organized churches, they have leadership, they have church services and so on. But for many of them, they don't know the truth of the gospel. And our work is to go amongst them and to bring the gospel to them in the name of churches like yourself. And God has really opened many doors for us. The ZEBS program is not simply to teach the pastors Bible and church administration, but we use it a lot for evangelism as well. You know, it's amazing to find a church... Uh, a congregation with many thousands of people and yet the pastor himself is not a believer does not know Christ and so we invite them to these classes and uh, we use it for teaching as well as for evangelism and I would ask you to pray that God would really help this issue, matter of syncretism to fade away amongst the Amazoni in southern Africa we are all syncretists in some way. For example, whenever you make yourself a cup of coffee and you put the coffee and the water and the sugar and the creamer and you mix it all together, that really is a form of syncretism, if you like, where different things are put together and all mixed into one. But unfortunately, when it comes to spiritual matters, if you mix the gospel with false teachings and false beliefs and you mix those things together, it becomes very dangerous. And what we find amongst the Amazoni in Southern Africa is that they've got the Bible, they, they talk about Jesus, uh, and sometimes they even talk about Jesus dying on the cross. But when it comes to knowing God, they import these false ideas about coming to God through the spirits of ancestors. Uh, they believe in a lot of what the prophets teach, which are, is false teaching. They talk about and accept polygamy. And so there's a lot of false teaching that comes into that which confuses the gospel. And uh, as I said, our main task then is to teach them and to evangelize them through this program called ZEBS. Now, I wanted you to feel a little bit of, of what it's like to be in a ZEBS class. And so I brought some notes along, and I hope none of you have read ahead on these notes, um, because then uh, you would know what they say already, I guess. Uh, is there anyone who kind of could give us a, a, a five-word summary of what's on this page? Well, I won't take time. You know you can't. <laughs> uh, this, this is actually in the Shona language. Okay, so if there was anyone here who could speak and read this, I think we'd pack you in our suitcase and take you straight back because if you can speak Shona, you'd make an excellent missionary in Mozambique. Uh, this is in the Shona language. It's uh, a lesson about uh, the Old Testament prophets and how God called the prophets and used them and so on. But I gave you this just to point out one of the difficulties we face in Zebs is wherever we go in Mozambique, wherever we go in South Africa, there are many, many different languages. And your pastor knows how we went from Maputo up to Tete. And through that process of about maybe 800 miles, there's probably about 20 or 30 different languages in that uh, process. Um, and uh, this particular language is in the southern part of Mozambique. 
But wherever we go, we need to use interpreters, we need our notes translated into different languages, and often you don't know who's going to be at the classes, and if you don't have the notes in their own language, um, <laughs> handing them out is of no value. You know, I could hand this to you, it's of no value to you, unless you understand it. So why don't you pray, one of the things to pray about concerns the language. I'm more used to having somebody standing next to me interpreting into a local language. Maybe right now you'd like someone to come and stand here and interpret into your, uh, your form of English. Um, but I, I do think that uh, language is one of the problems we face. And we'd ask you to pray for, with us that uh, this language matter will not be such a barrier. Another thing I brought along just to show you, I've got some uh, Mozambique coins here. And I thought of giving you one each just that you can take it home, but I'm not quite sure what you would do with it. I've got a whole handful here. And let me just show it to you. This would be enough for one day's lessons uh, in Mozambique. If we, if we had the classes together and someone brought all of those coins, it would be enough for them to get the notes for one day of teaching. Now, uh, you, you could come and count here and see how much it is. It's around about 100 meticas. Um, that comes to about two dollars. But you know, if I hold this together and you see how much coin it is, this is a lot of money for the people in, the Mo in Mozambique and also in different parts of South Africa. But it really comes in, in United States dollars to about two dollars for one day's worth of notes for teaching. We give them about 20 pages like this. And won't you, uh, part of the reason I wanted to share that with you is to thank you for your financial support of us. Part of what you give us, not, not all of what you give us goes for our salary and, and all of those kind of things, but really goes a lot for the ministry as well. And uh, we have to subsidize the notes and make sure they're published and prepared, interpreters are paid and so on. And so we do thank you not only for your prayers, but your financial support that we can make this happen. Um, and then the third thing I just wanted to share with you about the ZEBS program is that for many of the people, it's quite difficult to get to the classes. Um, and for Pastor Carlson, when he traveled with us up through Tete there, he know, knew the long distances and the police roadblocks and so on. But for many of the people, just to get to a class is quite difficult. Um, for us, living in Nelspray to get to a class in Maputo, it uh, takes us about five hours to drive to get there. And once you get into Mozambique, there's a border crossing to be made, and then there's lots of police roadblocks and so on. Um, and won't you pray that as people find it difficult to come to these classes, they would persevere and continue. Because this teaching of the Word of God and bringing the Gospel is really the only hope they have for knowing the truth. And we've seen people in many parts of Mozambique and around South Africa where they've said to us, if you did not come to us to tell us the good news, we would never have heard. We, could never, we would never go to one of the big cities. But because missionaries go out into the rural areas, the truth of the light comes to those places as well, and we want to thank you for your part in that as well. One of the things, as I said, is... Uh, oh, let, let, let's... Uh, there's some, some verses from God's Word I want us to read together before we turn to God's Word. And if you could uh, turn with me to Second Kings chapter 17. Second Kings chapter 17. Uh, one of the things we see in the Old Testament amongst the kings is how God called them in those days to walk in the light, and yet they mixed false teachings with the truth of God's teaching. And there's some verses here that I want us to read together, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about them. 2 Kings chapter 17, uh, and starting to read from verse 35. This is talking about what God said to the people as they came into the land of promise, and what He wanted them to become. When the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites, he commanded them, Do not worship any other gods or bow down to them. Serve them or sacrifice to them. But the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt with mighty power and outstretched arm is the one you must worship. To him you shall bow down and to him offer sacrifices. You must always be careful to keep the decrees and ordinances and laws and commands he wrote for you. Do not worship any other gods. Do not forget the covenant I have made with you. And do not worship other gods. Rather worship the Lord your God. It is He who will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. I think those words are pretty clear of what God expects. And even for us today, His word is very clear 
when we become part of God's family, He expects us to worship Him and Him alone. But let's carry on reading there to see what happened in the days of the kings. The people would not listen, however, but persisted in their former practices. Even while these people were worshipping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their fathers did. Maybe as you think about Zima and after we've left and as you pray for us, you could remember these verses because this really is the situation we so often face where God's word has come very clearly to, God, to the people, how they should live and how they should follow God, but they persist sometimes in doing the other things, the old things. And one of the things we've seen amongst the Amazoni is that how God's power is able to change them. What I'd like to share with you this morning, I've got uh, a special watch here. It's not that special, but uh, let's just pretend it's special. And if I press this big red button on here, let's pretend it can take us back in time to any place or t time that we could choose. Now, for those who might be nervous, let me just tell you this is just an illustration. It's not actually going to happen. When I press this button, you'll still be seated where you are. But I'm hoping it's going to help you think, let's move our thoughts back to a different time, a different place, and go and look at an illustration of what we've just read. So let me press the button, boom, and there we are. We're back in Jerusalem in the days of King Ahaz. And I don't want us to go and spend time reading from God's Word right now, but you could go and read about King Ahaz. And if you look at the city of Jerusalem in the days of King Ahaz, you would find the temple of God was there, but the temple of God was shut, it was closed down. And for many generations, no one had served God. No one had followed Him. The place of worship was there, but the people were not following God, just as we've read in God's Word. If you go and read the story of King Ahaz, God's word tells us four things about him. Now, I don't think any of us would like our lives to be summarized in just four phrases. But there are four things which God's word says very clearly about King Ahaz. And let me share this with you as we are here in Jerusalem uh, in the times of King Ahaz. The first thing the Bible tells us is that King Ahaz did not walk in the ways of King David. Now this is an amazing thing, when God in the Old Testament speaks about the days of the kings, so very often, almost every king, God says he either walked in the ways of David or didn't walk in the way of King David. That was kind of the measure. If you walked in the way of David, you were a good king. If you did not walk in the way of King David, you were an evil king. King Ahaz did not walk in the ways of King David. His father did not walk in the way of King David. His grandfather did not work. The temple was shut. There was no worship. This was the holy city of Jerusalem. In the days of King Ahaz, no worship taking place in the temple. And the king did not walk in the ways of David. The second thing we find about King Ahaz is that he worshipped the Baal, Baals. And that, you can put that in, in the plural in the, or the Baals. He worshipped the idols of the foreign nations around about him. And it says in, in God's word that he even sacrificed his son to these evil idols that, that did not follow God's ways. King Ahaz, not only did he not walk in the ways of King David, but he worshipped the Baals. He even sacrificed his son on the idol to these false gods. There's a third thing the Bible tells us about King Ahaz. That is that he provoked God to anger. Now remember who we're talking about. He's, he's the king of God's people. And yet the Bible tells us he provoked God. That word is such a strong word. You know what it means really? It's like if there's a, a snake in a hole. And uh, I don't know what you think about a snake in the hole. If I think there's a snake in a hole, I would run away as fast as I can. But this word gives us a picture of someone taking a stick and going sticking it down the hole in order to make that snake angry. That's the picture of how this king lived in relationship to God. It was as if he was taking a stick and pushing God and saying, I don't care about what you want. The temple is closed, there's no worship. The king of God's people worships Baal and then he provokes God to anger. And then one last thing that the Bible tells us about King Ahaz and there's maybe other things too, but the last thing I want to tell you about him is that he rejected God's word. We sang the song a little earlier, um, 
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. You know where that name Emmanuel comes from in the Old Testament? It's in the prophet Isaiah. Where Isaiah the prophet is sent by God to go to a certain king and say to him, Ask God for a sign. And you know, as I tell this story, I'm sure you know this so well. Where God says, tell the king to ask for a sign to see who I am. And that king's response is, I will not ask God for a sign. Many people, when they read that, they think, oh, this king is being very, you know, deferential to God and saying, well, I won't trouble God for a sign. But that isn't so. He's saying to God, I don't care what you say. I won't ask you for a sign. Then through the prophet Isaiah, God says, tell the king, Emmanuel will be born. And you know the preciousness of that word, Emmanuel. When we sing it, I can't, that's one of those parts of that song that I find difficult to sing. It is full of so much passion from God. Where God is saying, I am Emmanuel. I want to be amongst you. And this name of God is used only once in the Old Testament. That is to this king, Ahaz. This king who has shut the temple, who is provoking God, who is worshipping idols, to that king. God says, tell him, I'm Emmanuel. I want my grace to be seen to him. You know what King Ahaz does? He rejects it. He turns away and says, I don't want to hear from that God. And he turns away from that God. Well, let's press this button so we can go back to Zion in 2016. Because I personally, if I found myself in Jerusalem in the days of King Ahaz, I'm not certain how I would respond. Imagine living under a king like that. Uh... A king that has got no value as far as God's concerned. Places no value on God's word and just acts in a a provoking way towards God. So let's forget about Ahaz for a moment. But let me say this before we turn from him. One of the things we found amongst the Amazoni when we started uh, working with Zima 27 years ago or so, one of the things we found is that many of the things I've just said about Ahaz were also true of the Amazoni. You know, when you think about the Amazoni of 27 years ago, when we, when we began, one of the things we found over and over again is that many of the groups did not walk in the ways of God. They were religious gatherings, but they did not follow in God's ways. They did not worship God in truth and with light. Many of them did things that provoked God and consulted the spirits and followed the spirits of the dead. And many of them rejected God's word and didn't want anything to do with him. And so, although it's not as bad as the king, days of King Ahaz, there are many things that I see that relate to that as well. But let's uh, press this button again and go to another king. Uh, this time to King Hezekiah. Um, also a king uh, uh, in Jerusalem, King Hezekiah. And uh, one of the things you'll notice straight away is that uh, in the days of King Hezekiah, it's very different from the days of King um, Ahaz. One of the things you'll notice is that the temple doors are open. One of the things that uh, is said about King Hezekiah is that he walked in the ways of King David. He was someone who worshipped God. And if you go and read about King Hezekiah, he followed in the ways of God. He did not provoke God like Ahaz. In fact, he promoted God. He told the priests and the Levites to go and teach God's word and take God's word to others, making sure that people knew what God, believed, what God taught and what he wanted them to do. Another thing we know about King Hezekiah is that when God gave him a sign and said to Hezekiah, there's something I want to ask you, Hezekiah listened to what God said. Maybe when you get home you can go and read uh, concerning King Hezekiah when he got sick. The prophet came to him and said, God says to you, do you want the shadow to go forward or to go backwards? And you can choose. And unlike King Ahaz who rejected God's word, King Hezekiah said, I will listen and follow what God said. And the amazing thing about Hezekiah during his day, although he had those dips and those times when he did not follow God completely, his life, when we come to his life in the, 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 the Old Testament books, Concerning Hezekiah, it says to us, he walked in God's ways and he followed after God. And it was a very different picture from the days of King Ahaz. So let me press the button and we come back to Zion in 2016. And let's just take a moment to compare those two kings. Ahaz 
where the king and the people did not follow God. There was rampant syncretism, turning away from God, provoking God to anger, not listening to God's word. And then King Hezekiah, who promoted God, worshipped God, followed in the ways of God, accepted the sign that God gave him. And here's a question I want to ask you. How long do you think it took to go from King Ahaz to King Hezekiah? How many years does it take for a nation to turn? How many years does it take for a person's life to turn around and, and go from being someone who is hateful to God and going to, be, to become someone who follows God? How long does that process take? Well, you know the thing that really encourages me, and I'm sure many of you already know this, that Hezekiah, in fact, was the son of Ahaz. If you go and read the story of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, it tells us that when King Ahaz died, in the first month of the first year of King Hezekiah, he opened the temple and he began to promote the work of God and following after God. It was within days of King Ahaz that this change took place. You know, friends, one of the things I want to share with you today is we've only been with uh, Zima for 27 years. But we have noticed in our lifetime, and this is what gives me hope, in our lifetime, there's been such a tremendous change among so many Amazoni. As I said, when we first went there, there was so much darkness. We, almost every church we went to, it was a time of darkness, of confusion, of worship in a way which was not Christian, uh, teaching that was not Christian, and total confusion in many of the churches. In fact, many times I was quite fearful to be in some of those church services because the things that they were doing were so separate from my understanding of Christianity. You often wondered where you really were. But in just these years that we've been involved, we've seen God change so many Amazoni. And so again, I want to thank you for your prayers and your support because God is doing something which we 27 years ago certainly did not think was possible. And he has changed so many Amazoni. We see the way of sharing the gospel with them has changed over the years. At the moment, Zima uses the radio. We have people working on university campuses. We have the Zebs program. And through all of these different things, we've seen men and women change to the point where I can stand before you today and say that most of the work amongst the Amazoni in Southern Africa is not being done by Western missionaries but it's been done by local pastors who've been trained through the missionaries and who have become part of our team and who are now continuing sh spreading the light. And that song we sang about uh, send the light, take the light, spread the light to others, it's not just the missionaries doing it anymore, but Amazioni who've come to know the truth. And by far the bigger work is being done by local people who've been trained by the missionaries. And for that we give thanks to God. I want to finish by just uh, sharing a, a quick illustration with you. And uh, it's a story about three men um, who were given a job in one company. The first man, his job was to dig a hole in the ground. And that was all that he knew. He was trained to do that. And he dug the hole. He knew exactly how deep it must go. He knew the dimensions. And he did that job very well. But he knew nothing more than that. All he knew, I must dig that hole. And that's all he did. The second man in the same company, uh, they worked together as a team, but his job was slightly different. His job was to bring a pole, put the pole in the ground, connect it with wires to that pole and that pole, and then leave it there. And that was all his work. He needed to do nothing more than that. Uh, he would come to where the first man had dug the hole, he'd put the pole in, put the wires up, and then he'd move on. Then there was a third man in this team. His job was to come to where that pole had been put in the ground and put the sand in again and make sure that that pole is strong and solid and uh, make sure it stood and that everything was okay. So those three men worked together in the same company doing the, following each other, the first one digging the hole, the second one putting the pole in, the third one coming and filling the hole and they worked really well as a team and so these poles went up. Then came the day when the second man got sick and wasn't able to come to work. Um, and so the first man was there and he wanted to work. The third man was there and he wanted to work, but the second man who had to uh, put the pole in, he was sick and not able to come. The first man and the third man did not know how to do that work and so they could not do it. And 
Uh, but they did not want to stop and wait for the other man to get well again. So they said, we will carry on with the work, even though number two is not here. And so that's what happened. The first man dug the hole. The third man came and filled the hole. And there they worked along and they kept doing their work, doing their work very well, doing it according to the code, doing it according to plan, doing it very efficiently, working very hard, looking very good, but achieving absolutely nothing. And I want to say to you today that sometimes Geraldine and I and the other missionaries are maybe are man number one and man number three. But to a large extent, you here are man number two. And as you play your part, you are such an integral part of what we do on the field. As we go amongst the Amazoni to places where there's so much confusion, so much error in teaching, and there there are people behind us praying for us, supporting us, being part of our team, we could work as hard as we like, but without you standing by us, uh, we would not be as effective as we could be. And so we want to thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for your prayers. We thank you for the things you send to encourage us. And we just pray that God would continue to bless you and use you, and that the work amongst the Amazon in Southern Africa would grow. We look forward to maybe other teams coming to visit us, maybe someone being called to come and join the work of Zima in South Africa. Um, it's a great work that God is using in a great way. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that as you called us to be part of your family, you changed us and you gave us light. We thank you that you care for us and that you love the world. We thank you that your love extends to people who have not heard about you before. And so we thank you for the opportunities that you give where we can share your light both here in Zion as well as in South Africa. We thank you that you are able to change people. As we've thought about King Ahaz and the confusion in his day and the error and the false teaching, we thank you that by your spirit you are able to change even a nation. You are able to change leaders' thinking. You are able to change people. And for both the United States and for South Africa, we pray at this time that you, by your grace, would move towards us in love and pour out your mercy on us, and that we, as your people, might share your light in a way that people would understand and value, and that people would turn to you and find life. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you that you've moved towards us with grace. We pray that as we go now, that we would go into the world with your love and, and your grace and your mercy and share who you are with others that their lives too might be touched. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.